I'm so excited for Professor Kirsten Pye Buick to join us virtually this evening to explore Mary Edmonia Lewis, her career as a contemporary of Frederick Church, and her connection to some of the most compelling debates of the 19th century, the fight to abolish slavery, true womanhood, spirituality, and the United States relationship to its indigenous populations. So Kirsten Buick was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. She went to the University of Chicago where she double majored in art history and Italian literature. After receiving her BA from the university, she thought to continue her Italian studies at the University of Michigan. But after living in Italy for eight months in the early 1990s and noting the prominence of US visual culture in Europe, she switched her area of concentration to British colonial and US art. She has published extensively on African-American art and been the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum's pre-doctoral fellowship and the Charles Gaius Boland Fellowship at Williams College. In 2015, she became the 10th recipient of the David C. Driscoll Prize for Excellence in African-American Art History. She has taught at the University of New Mexico since 2001, where she specializes in art of the US, African-American art, gender and race as they impact the historiography of art, representations of the American landscape, and the history of women as patrons and collectors of the arts. Her book, Child of the Fire, Mary Edmonia Lewis and the Problem of Art History's Black and Indian Subject is published by Duke University Press. And her second book, which sounds very exciting, In Authenticity, Kara Walker and the Eidetics of Racism is currently in progress. I'm so thrilled to welcome Kirsten. Thanks very much for being with us this evening. Good evening, everyone. I am so thrilled uh, and honored to be with you this evening. And uh, my talk this evening is on a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I've been working on Mary and Monia Lewis in some capacity for 30 years now. And uh, this evening's talk, uh, very casual, because you know it's hard for me to write things down anymore about her, but uh, it's Into the Maelstrom, the life and career of Mary and Monia Lewis. And I'd like to begin by thanking the Olana Partnership Sean Sawyer, Washburn and Susan Overweger, President, William Coleman, PhD, Director of Collections and Exhibitions, Margo Isaacs, Membership and Volunteer Coordinator, and Carolyn Keough, Director of Education and Public Programs. Thank you all for making me feel so welcome. And I'd like to also dedicate my lecture this evening to Professor David Huntington, my late advisor, and the person who revealed to me the wonders of Olana, and to my late mother, Jerry Buick, with whom I was able to experience Olana during a cross-country drive. She fell in love with it and read every book and article I could send her about it. So I always like to ground my discussion of Lewis in um, neoclassicism in the 19th century, how her career was made possible, uh, the debate around uh, the role of women was heating up. It was furious uh, in the 19th century. And in part, it was because women were becoming activists. They were speaking out and speaking up. And they were taking roles normally not assigned to them. And so women became a problem. And like uh, many things in the 19th century that became problems or questions, a lot of attention was paid to the woman question or the woman problem, the Indian question, the Indian problem, the Negro question, the Negro problem. But uh, one of the things that American, uh, Americanists, American artists, American uh, critics were paying attention to is this idea that a, a national art should emerge and whether it was through history painting or landscape painting or sculpture, that this national, this new national art should focus on morality and it should be modern. It should be relevant to the period in which it uh, exists. And so I always like to use the case of Hiram Powers' Greek slave because she embodies um, pretty much everything that a true woman was supposed to be. And he was clever, uh, an artist from Cincinnati working in Florence. He was clever in that he managed to allude to uh, African enslavement 
without offending the sensibilities of those who were uh, part of the slave power. And so he makes up this story about this, this Greek woman who uh, was a victim of the recent Greek and Turkish wars, uh, kidnapped and sold into slavery uh, and eventually purchased by a lustful Turk. Um, and she embodied everything. Uh, she was modest, she assumes through the, uh, con the convention of the chains, the Venus Pudica pose, um, a lovely contrapposto. Uh, she's also modest, she's chaste. Uh, she's domesticated and domestic. There's a little locket that she managed to take from her home as well as a cross. So she's also pious. So all of these things that uh, a true woman was supposed to be. And the proliferation in the 19th century of women who were in chains, women who were suicidal, women who were dead or dying, um, the proliferation of these images uh, and you know it, it translated also to plays and to uh, paintings. The proliferation was to act as a corrective to the increasing um, um, vocality of white women in particular. And so the Greek slave was a teaching moment for um, these out of control American women. So much so that the scholar Charles Kohlberg, uh, in his book, A Measure of Perfection, Phrenology and the Fine Arts in America, published in 1997, found this very fascinating plate. It's from Joseph Rhodes Buchanan's System of Anthropology, uh, and it's titled Outlines of Lectures on the Neurological System of Anthropology. It's published in Cincinnati in 1854. And it shows you the various regions of the Greek slave. And so uh, the, the virtues, the benefits of sculpture were that it could uh, model the body in three dimensions and um, tap into the racialized sciences of the day, craniology, measuring the skull, uh, phrenology, feeling out the lumps and bumps of the skull to uh, determine um, uh, character and therefore fate, and, and because through character is behavior, and for, uh, physiognomy, which reads the entire body. So this idea of bodily legibility is very important. And you can see the vegetative region, the region of animality, the region of humanity, and so the, the size of your behind indicated your ability to hate. Um, and the region of insanity is also helpfully uh, pointed out. But there's another um, thing that this sculpture could teach one. And this, is, this was Colbert's, Charles, uh, Charles Colbert's uh, revelation is that her uncorseted, clearly uncorseted waist, right, speaks to physical bodily health. And so the Greek slave becomes not only a model of ideal womanhood, she also represents health um, and, you know, and, and the anti-corset uh, debate she, she becomes part of. In terms of women who aspired to be artists, there was a caution in there, built in there, and there were limits to female creativity. When Winslow Homer published this for Harper's Weekly in 1868, he very deliberately titled, titled it art students who were male and copyists who were understood to be women working in the Louvre. Uh, women were not to aspire to genius. Genius could, the, the aspiration to genius could pervert uh, your physical self. It could rewire your brain and drive you insane. Uh, and so the most that a woman could aspire to was to simply copy great works of art. This didn't stop women, however. Women like Harriet Hosmer. This is what John Rogers, the sculptor uh, and first cousin to Louisa Lander, another sculptor living and working in Rome. 
uh, said about Harriet Hosmer and Charlotte Cushman, the actress. Charlotte Cushman is one of those Cyclops that I am afraid of. I didn't pursue the acquaintance very far. She and Miss Hosmer and Miss Stebbins smoke cigars together and are quite intimate. And so these are, these are the women, the caliber of the women who preceded Edmonia Lewis to Rome and who made her career possible. They paved the way. Harriet Hosmer, born in 1830, died in 1908, ran into a bit of trouble with her sculpture of Zenobia. It was modeled in 1857, and she was charged with not doing the creative work that it took to make a sculpture, which simply meant that like all of the sculptors living and working in Rome, they hired Italian artists to fill their workshops and the sculptors themselves simply designed the idea in clay. Uh, they may or may not have translated it to um, plaster. This could have been done by the Italian men who worked in their workshops. And then it was translated to marble. Well, the accusation that Harriet Hosmer had not done her own work meant that she hadn't done the conceptual work because labor in the 19th century was broken down to the genius, and then the work of the hands, the, the work of, of manual labor. And uh, Italians were certainly aware of this. And when I was uh, working in the archives in Italy, I found a very interesting article uh, in a, published in an Italian journal that complained about these American, British, and Danish sculptors who descend on Italy and simply play in the clay while it was at the, the actual Italian men working in those studios who did the, labor, the, the actual work. Um, Lydia Maria Child, who uh, I'll mention again later in the, the lecture, wrote a spirited defense of Harriet Hosmer and explained in great detail workshop practices of the 19th century. Uh, and I think her defense of Hosmer may have been published in the Atlantic Monthly. I think that's right. It's, you can still find it, it's still available. And, uh, you know, these women were competition. And here's the Prince of Wales uh, in Miss Hosmer's studio. And this was published in Harper's Weekly. So the news comes back to the United States that in 1859, the Prince of Wales not only visited Miss Hosmer's studio, but uh, saw this monumental sculpture created by Hosmer that Hosmer was taking possession of you know, taking ownership of. Yes, I did the conceptual work. And then there's Anne Whitney, um, 1821, 1915, actually a friend of Edmonia Lewis's. Uh, and she runs into trouble in terms of the limits of female creativity with her sculpture of Senator Sumner. Um, when he passed away, there was a competition announced to create um, a marble sculpture of Sumner uh, to celebrate his life. And they asked that the uh, entrance to the competition send their models anonymously. And Anne Whitney won. She won the competition. And when they found out it was a woman, they gave her the money but said, no, it's inappropriate for a woman to sculpt the limbs of a man. And so it wasn't until 25 years later that Harvard University erected the statue in Cambridge, so it's not where it should have been. But here's one of the losers, Augustus St. Gaudens. And this is his work around the time of the Sumner competition, his Hiawatha, very melancholy figure. And uh, those of you uh, who are familiar with the name may be more familiar with his design for the double eagle. So Oberlin College, um, she was born, born on or about the 4th of July in 1844. Uh, she was born Mary Edmonia Lewis in uh, Rensselaer, New York by 1856. Uh, she had lived and traveled with the Ojibwe. Her mother was Ojibwe and African-American. Her father was African-American. Her older brother uh, who had been born in Haiti uh, after their parents' death went west to make his fortune. He left Lewis in New York 
and he sent her to private day school. And from 1856 to, 50, uh, to 1858, she attended New York Central College, which was a radical center of abolitionism and co-education in McGraw, New York. And she was signed up as Mary E. Lewis. In 1859, she entered Oberlin College. Uh, and Oberlin uh, thought of itself also as a radical center of gender equality and anti-slavery. It certainly was that. However, um, and Oberlin certainly likes to remember and remind people of their role in abolitionism. But when I look deeper into how women were educated at Oberlin, despite the fact that they allowed women to enter, they still restricted what women could study. They could not take Latin, they couldn't take geometry. Uh, they, were, they were educated for their sphere. Uh, they were educated to become mothers and wives. And if they were unsuccessful in that endeavor, they were educated to teach other women's children. Uh, and um, this is one of the earliest drawings known to exist by Edmonia Lewis. Uh, it was made in 1862 and it was a gift to one of her classmates. So she, had, she expresses a very early interest in art, even though later on in the abolitionist press when they're writing about, here, uh, about her, they always make it seem as if she was untaught and that she, you know, there's one very famous story about her that she saw a stack, she saw a stone man and said, I too can make a stone man. It was supposed, supposedly a statue of Benjamin Franklin. And so they, they constantly painted her as uh, a primitive. And then there were a series of scandals at Oberlin that stymied her time there, stymied her career, her education. In 1862, in January, she was accused of poisoning two of her white housemates. And Cleveland uh, was a Democrat, uh, Democratic run, uh, pro-slavery town. And the newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, they were always watching Oberlin because they didn't think that the experiment in co-education, that the experiment in uh, biracial or triracial education would work. And so they started hearing these rumors that uh, a, a black woman, a black girl had poisoned two white women um, and they, they were wondering why the Edmonia Lewis hadn't been arrested. And so on January 31st, after a series of articles by the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Lewis was kidnapped and taken to an abandoned field and beaten. She may have been raped, uh, but that's not something that would necessarily be advertised. So finally, to keep her safe, uh, the man who, the, the family that ran the boarding house where she stayed, um, allowed her to be arrested. So it was jail, ironically, that kept her safe after that. She was defended by John Mercer Langston, who uh, was the first black elected official uh, in Ohio. And he was the great uncle of Langston Hughes, the poet. And a very clever defense um, uh, of corpus delecti, they, they didn't have the stomach or stool contents of the women who claimed they'd been poisoned by Lewis. Uh, she was exonerated. And uh, let me say this, Oberlin, you know, despite being co-educational, uh, they were a, a dry campus, they were a temperance campus. And you couldn't uh, go unchaperoned uh, with, with you know, with men and these, these girls got caught. And so what do they do? They blame Edmonia Lewis. Uh, they blame her. They say she gave them wine, okay, temperance campus. She, and that she not only gave them wine, she gave them wine laced with Spanish fly, which was uh, an aphrodisiac. And so from their minor crime of drinking and going unchaperoned on a sleigh ride where they get sick and get caught, it becomes now, um, they become the victims 
and Edmonia Lewis, the, the criminal. So in 1863, uh, Lewis is still uh, um, a thorn under the skin of certain um, administrators at Oberlin. Uh, I, one of the things I found was that she was not allowed to join this, the ice skating uh, group and she protested and they finally let her join. So she's still um, you know, speaking up and, and not being cowed by, by the thing that happened in 1862. So in February, almost a year later, she was accused of stealing brushes and paints. Then she was accused of stealing a picture frame. And she was denied her final term and thus graduation. And she met Frederick Douglass, who advised her to go east. And she proceeded to Boston with letters of introduction. And this is how the abolitionist network worked. And this is how any network in the 19th century worked. You, you got letters uh, that kind of bought you passage to um, other uh, important parties. And to this day, the students at Oberlin, while they will allow buildings to be named for her, they say that Oberlin doesn't deserve the right to grant Lewis a posthumous degree. So they, they, they blame Oberlin, say it's Oberlin's fault. But here, um, here is the, the kind of foundation of her network, the, the two men who will, um, whose letters will have, allow her to introduce herself in Boston. And so from 1863 to 1865, she goes to Boston. And she's written up, uh, or as I say, she's written into existence by the abolitionist press. And it wasn't all um, roses, but the two people who are most important to her in Boston uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who ran the newspaper, The Liberator, and his editor, Lydia Maria Child. And uh, there were a group of women whose, who, whose patronage of Lewis was uh, profound, but complicated. In 1863, she goes to Boston with letters of introduction to William Lloyd Garrison, which uh, gains her entry when she announces that she'd like to be a sculptor gains her entry to the studio of William Brackett, who's a, an ardent abolitionist. She took a space in the studio building, and here she's being underwritten by her devoted brother, Samuel. She produced medallions of John Brown and other celebrated abolitionists, as well as a bust of Voltaire. In May of that year, Robert Gould Shaw paraded black troops through Boston on their way to war, and she witnesses this. Uh, in July, Colonel Shaw was martyred uh, with his troops as they charged Fort Wagner. In 1864, Lydia Maria Child, feminist and founder of the New England, one of the, one of the founders of the New England abolition movement, began to publicize Lewis's talent. In August, Ann Whitney and others helped Lewis with her bust of Shaw. Uh, she showed her bust to Child and Maria Weston Chapman. Now we know from the private correspondence of Lydia Maria Child that she wasn't too enthusiastic about Lewis uh, creating a bust of Robert Shaw. She wrote to Shaw's mother saying that, oh my gosh, she's put her primitive hands on you know, your son's beloved face and I discouraged it, but she persists. Uh, in November, Harriet Hosmer endorsed the, the Shaw bust and then Lewis memorializes Sergeant William H. Kearney, who is African-American and another hero and martyr of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. Lewis ends up selling 100 plaster copies of the Shaw bust. And in December, Anna Quincy Waterston published a poem about Lewis and her bust of Shaw. In 1865, Child promoted the Shaw bust in the National Anti-Slavery Standard and the Liberator and then Lewis makes a bust of Maria Weston Chapman. So you can see how the back and forth of, of patronage uh, and patronage systems. But this was her bust of Shaw that she ends up selling 100 plaster copies of. And this is what funds her relocation to Europe, first Florence and then to Rome. And this is what um, Child does to the bust. After mutilating Lewis's statue, she cuts it off. Um, 
below the shoulders. Child invites the artist to her home and asks, there, doesn't this look better? Um, and, you know, she, Child writes about this uh, in her, she writes this in her letters to Shaw's mother. So abolitionist patronage was fraught. It wasn't as easy as it appears. In fact, Child refused to uh, advertise Forever Free. And I'll talk about that when we get to the sculpture. But we know that at the end of the war, Lewis, uh, on her way to Rome, she stops in Richmond, Virginia in July of 1865. And the only reason we know that is because her trunk was stolen. She accompanied, she and her friend Ada Howard journeyed to Richmond to teach freed slaves. And their trunks were stolen and found empty in an abandoned field. And, the, and so that's why we know about her, her stay in Richmond because a notice is published in the local newspaper bemoaning the theft. And let me stop here and say that one of the most intriguing things for me in working on Lewis was that she was an artist with so much missing biography. And having studied art history, um, one of the things I began to notice is how uh, those artists who had ovaries or those artists who had race, uh, their artworks were always in, or generally interpreted as somehow reinforcing our most narrowly perceived ideas about their identity. And so the, the, when uh, Rick Powell told me um, that don't bother working on American genre painting, work on Edmonia Lewis, uh, and I, I started researching her, I was intrigued. So, so what do you do with an artist whose life, whose career you have to piece together using only newspaper notices for the most part, or finding letters written by other people about her. What do you do when you can't hang your interpretations on their biography? So you start to build contexts. And that's what I did. And, and uh, it's fueled my teaching for 30 years. And so she goes to Rome, Italy, and we're always finding new photos and new works of art, sometimes exactly where they're supposed to be. Like the most recent find was uh, a sculpture of Christ that she did for the Catholic Marcus of, of Butte. And it was right where it was supposed to be on the Isle of Butte. Um, but we recently found this uh, carte de visite of Lewis and it's the Fratelli D'Alessandri Corso uh, numero 12, Roma. And so that gives the address of their uh, photographic studio. And she took this lovely picture. And so between 1865 and 1896, Lewis is living and working in Rome. And she's becoming um, trilingual, trilingual. She's learning Italian and eventually will learn a little French. When Lewis arrives, um, Italy is in the process of attempting to unify. And um, it's, it's a period called the Risorgimento. Um, Camillo da Cavour, an aristocrat from Northern Italy. He won French support against Austria. His goal was a constitutional monarchy. Uh, then there's Giuseppe Garibaldi. Uh, I, I'm waiting for the film to be made about him. He led the peasant revolt in Sicily and his goal was a Republican Italy. The kingdom of Italy was finally declared in March of 1861, but uh, they were still battling it out. And you can see on this map how much territory was owned by the papal states. And Pope Pius IX, Pio Nonno, uh, he was the main impediment to a unified Italy, an Italy that had been unified through language. Uh, we can still read medieval Italian because of Dante and Boccaccio and uh, Petrarch, an Italy that had been um, unified by the, the Alps, which you know, separates it from the rest of Europe, but had, had not become its own country yet. 
And here are the two main antagonists. And this is Edmonia Lewis's Pope. She was Catholic. And this was the Pope that she knew uh, most of her life. And then there's Victor Emmanuel, Re d'Italia, where the name Verdi comes from. The last warrior Pope. And, and somehow as Catholics were, were able to do in the 19th century, they were able to reconcile their faith and their politics. There's this great uh, anecdote um, about French troops marching through Rome. And uh, we know this because of Anne Whitney's letters, letters home. She and Lewis were observing the French, the French troops who were um, you know, fighting on the side at that time of the Pope. And um, you know, someone asks, where are they going? And Lewis says, to the devil, and she swings her fist and falls into a hole and had to be helped out by a bystander. But even as Lewis was um, in favor of a unified Italy, she was also a devout Catholic. And she makes in 1872, the Central Park Lincoln. Uh, and you can see the two women who hold him up. And then uh, around the base, at the back of the statue of Lincoln by Lewis is a uh, two, two male figures. One is an enslaved African, and the other is his transformation into a, a Zouave soldier. And the Zouave regiments fought in um, the Civil War, and they fought, uh, they, they were formed and, and fought uh, in Italy as well. And uh, Garibaldi and Lincoln were great friends. Lincoln actually invited Garibaldi to help in the, the Union uh, cause. And Garibaldi said, only if you make me um, head of the army and if all enslavement can be abolished. And Lincoln said, thanks, but no thanks. And uh, they remain great friends. So in 1867, Lewis is in Rome and she decides all on her own to uh, create a sculpture and on speculation and send it back to Boston and have it dedicated to the minister Henry Highland Garnet, who was um, uh, vital to, he's African American, vital to the Underground Railroad. And one of, one of the things he was known for was reuniting, reuniting uh, black men and black women who had been separated by enslavement. And Lydia Maria Child said, no, don't do it. I, you're, you're not ready to do this level of sculpture. And I, I think you can see why Child would uh, complain. Look at the thickness of his ankle and his foot, the bigness of his foot, the, the kind of bad proportions. Uh, and so when Child refused to advertise it, in back home in the abolitionist newspapers, Elizabeth Peabody did for the Christian Examiner. Uh, Peabody is interesting. She was uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's sister-in-law. He was terribly afraid of her. She spoke uh, fluent German uh, and started the kindergarten, um, started kindergarten in the United States. But this is Lewis's uh, Forever Free. It's now in, at Howard University made um, in honor of the Emancipation Proclamation, but four years later. And it shows, it's very unusual in that um, the enslaved man is half naked. That's not the unusual part, but the absence of Lincoln is unusual. And the fact that he seems to take his own freedom, that he, he breaks his chains, raises his fists, and uh, has his hand on the shoulder of his wife. And now they can legally marry with uh, emancipation. And she takes the pose of the, we the inspired by the Wedgwood medallion that uh, is made in, um, in London in 1787 or so. And by the time it gets here, the am I not a man and a brother, the male figure is replaced with a female figure. And this is the inspiration for her, uh, the, the woman in Lewis's sculpture. This is how African-American men were normally depicted post-emancipation as grateful uh, uh, to 
a beneficent Lincoln, right? And this is, this is what Marcus Wood, who wrote the book, The Horrible Gift of Freedom, calls the terrible, describes as the terrible lie of freedom, that the institution, the system that enslaved you will somehow also set you free. But images like this were actually used to curtail um, uh, fears around black male violence and revenge should they be set free. And so these images, the one on the left is from Courier and Ives, the one on the right is Thomas Ball's Freedmen's Memorial in Lincoln Park in Washington, DC. And there's some discussion now about removing it. But um, the, the bent back, the obeisance to Lincoln, the gratefulness, all of these things were uh, the kind of usual way of depicting black male freedom, which makes Lewis's figure all the more unusual. And kind of playing up her Indian heritage, uh, she, she takes um, a bust of Longfellow. He visits her studio when she's in Rome in 1871 and she takes his portrait and she does a series of sculptures inspired by his uh, song of Hiawatha. And he gives, she gives us the courtship of Hiawatha. And this version is from 1863, the wooing of Hiawatha you see on the base. This is Minnehaha, and this is her father, the old arrow maker. And here's the roebuck thrown at their feet. So Hiawatha is um, an, the implied figure. And then uh, she gives us the marriage of Hiawatha. Yeah. So the, the companion pieces. And what's unusual about Lewis's interpretation is that she never shows us uh, Hiawatha vanishing into the mists, mists with the coming of white men nor does she give us Minnehaha's tragic death. Instead, she gives us courtship and marriage and stops the story there. Only the happiest moments of, of, um, of, of their lives. And so this is consistent, um, whether it's Forever Free or uh, Hiawatha, this idea of a very Victorian idea of a happy, uh, marriage. In other realms of representation, Native Americans are, are remembered differently. And this is Thomas Crawford's um, simply called now Progress of Civilization at the U.S. Capitol over the Senate uh, building. And I, you know, I was teaching, I'd been teaching this for years, and I'd always stand in front of America and point and kind of lay out what was happening, the the man who represents commerce. Uh, there's a wheel uh, here, the, you know, kind of mechanic, uh, education, white men dominating this side, a figure who looks suspiciously like George Washington, either drawing or sheathing his sword, the pioneer who chops down the tree, the, in the personification of America flanked by a bald eagle and a rising sun, the uh, wilderness, um, the wilderness, um, a young boy kind of looking forlornly over his shoulder, a depressed Indian, a woman, a, a Native American woman with a, a child at her breast, and an open grave. And I've been teaching this for years, and all of a sudden, it's like, okay, I know what this is. It's a secular last judgment. America stands where Christ would. Um, on Christ's proper left are the damned. And that's where Crawford places First Nations people. And on Christ's proper right are the saved. And that's where all the, the white men and boys are. It's quite a revelation. I've actually published this, um, this essay. If you're interested, you can email me and I'll, I'd be happy to send you a copy uh, on, on the work I've done on the pediment. And she also, you know, the, in the realm of the unhappy coupling, if you will, uh, she takes an interest in the figure of Hagar, who in the 19th century was a metaphor for chattel slavery. Uh, Hagar was the Egyptian bondmaid to Sarah and Abraham. Sarah, who's 90 years old, can't become pregnant. And so she sanctions the rape of Hagar by um, 
um, Abraham and Hagar gets pregnant and she's cast out. The angel of the Lord, as she's searching desperately for water, the angel of the Lord comes and tells her, you know, go back, be a servant. And she has her son Ishmael and she's cast out again. Normally, uh, whether it's painting uh, or sculpture, uh, Ishmael is present. And this is Edward Sheffield, Bartholomew's Hager and Ishmael from 1856. Lewis absence uh, Ishmael. And that always puzzled me. And once again, having, you know, been a medievalist, um, the kind of the first iteration of my time as an art historian, I realized that her inspiration was probably Donatello's Mary Magdalene. Uh, this idea of a penitent Hagar who uh, is aware that, you know, she had committed adultery in Victorian terms and uh, begs forgiveness for this sin and so reclaims her subjectivity. And it's only through the absence of Ishmael is, could this, uh, this kind of direct correlation be possible. Lewis remained in Europe. Um, she traveled throughout and she would accompany works back uh, to the United States and sell them at things like Catholic fairs. After, after the end of enslavement, after her abolitionist patronage dries up, she sustains herself by making tr brief trips to the United States. She uh, increasingly goes farther out west and she there, it's there that she sells work. Uh, she also finds patrons among European and US Catholics. This was found a few years ago. It's her Veiled Bride of Spring. It was sold at a Catholic fair in Cincinnati. It was discovered recently in a library in Kentucky. You can see she'd upped her game quite a bit uh, since Forever Free. And then she gets one of her works gets chosen for the Philadelphia Centennial. Uh, one of the things you did when you traveled to Italy in the 19th century was you'd buy your guidebook and at the back of the guidebook would be the addresses of sculptors and painters who were American and you'd buy American. You'd, you'd go, you'd visit their studios and you'd buy uh, paintings, you'd buy sculptures. And when the centennial was um, about to happen a year or so before, uh, someone came out and visited her studio and chose her Death of Cleopatra to represent the United States. And this is one of the only known photographs of the original appearance of the Cleopatra. Uh, by 1878, Cleopatra was in Chicago. That's a whole nother story. But you can see uh, the condition it was in. And what's very important is that you can see the shadow that can, gives you a hint at the aquiline nose, which was commented on very frequently in the 19th century. Edward Mitchell Bannister, an African-American landscape artist, was also represented at this Philadelphia Centennial. Uh, this is his painting, The Approaching Storm. You can see the influence of the Barbizon School, but he actually won a certificate for Under the Oaks. And the only, the only thing that survives is this sketch of the painting, but there's his certificate. And Henry Osawa Tanner was a visitor to the Centennial. And so I'm sure he was inspired by seeing the work of uh, Bannister and Lewis. Cleopatra, um, that was very brave of Lewis because what she did was throw her hat into the representational ring. Uh, these sculptures were monumental. They, um, the first two iterations covered some point in her death. So how would Lewis finish this cycle? Uh, with William Wetmore Story's Cleopatra, she is contemplating death. And there's the asp that is supposed to um, finish her off. And again, it's this this concentration in the 19th century with suicidal women. How do you neutralize a powerful woman? And then there's Thomas Ridgway Gould's Death of Cleopatra, modeled in 1873. And he shows a Cleopatra 
in the middle of dying. Now, <clears throat> what was kind of extra about Cleopatra were the debates over her race, which we still have today, which are kind of not is kind of nonsensical because you know to be black or white there three thousand years ago there's really no such thing, but William Wetmore's story had represented his Cleopatra uh, as African, and you can read that in the relative thickness of her nose. Uh, that's certainly how she was understood in the 19th century. And according to critics, Thomas Ridgway Gould had given us a more accurate Cleopatra who was Aryan. Because the debate, of course, was, was Cleopatra black? And if so, how could this black woman lead an entire nation when we know that black people don't have that capacity? So when abolitionists lined up and say Cleopatra is definitely sub-Saharan African, um, they were actually um, promoting the idea that African Americans could responsibly hold power. Um, and so Lewis enters the debate with the Cleopatra already dead. So contemplating death, dying dead. And that's how she uh, closes the circle and says to the audience that I am as capable as anyone uh, creating a monumental sculpture. Now with painting, it was easier to show your hand in terms of your beliefs about Cleopatra's race. For a French artist like Richen, he was able to simply darken the skin of her attendants and make her visibly whiter. Uh, for Sarah Bernhardt, uh, I found a review. Uh, she did a 30 year long farewell tour and stubbornly performed in French, even in front of American audiences who had no idea what she was saying, but it was her presence. But in 1863 in The Nation, there was a, a letter of complaint to the editor because they'd seen Sarah Bernhardt performing Cleopatra and she, darkened her skin and wore a wool wig. And we know, we all know Cleopatra was an Aryan. And so she offended lots of sensibilities. But in 1963, the debate continues and Elizabeth Taylor performs and with the presence of the obviously Nubian slaves um, in 1963, we get this um, accounting of the suicidal queen. And so the, the 19th century was all about profiling, right? And profiles told about character. And Edmonia Lewis weighs in to the debate by giving us a Cleopatra much closer, kind of out of the black and white debate altogether, but instead archeologically correct by modeling her Cleopatra on the coins uh, struck during uh, her reign not flattering at all. But in the uh, mid 90s, when this, the sculpture had been relocated and restored, the conservator shaved down her nose. And so we're kind of left with uh, this. Well, let me say one last thing. Um, the debate over Cleopatra those who were pro-slavery and said that Cleopatra was white and that her slaves were sub-Saharan African, they used this historical evidence as the corollary to the biblical sanctioning of enslavement. And so in 1896, Lewis leaves Italy she moves to Paris. She, she was a great fan of the opera. Uh, we know that thanks to Frederick Douglass who visited her um, on his honeymoon. Um, but she leaves Italy and I was always puzzled by that. And then I started, of course, building a context, uh, building another context for late 19th century Italy. And this is what's happening in Italy at the time. The first Italo-Ethiopian War it was fought between Italy and Ethiopia from 1895 
1896. It originated from a disputed treaty, which the Italians claimed turned the country into an Italian protectorate. Italy was supported by two other Triple Alliance members, Germany and Austria. Much to their surprise, they found that Ethiopian ruler Menelik II, rather than being opposed by some of his traditional enemies, was supported by them. So the Italian army invading Ethiopia from Italian Eritrea in 1893 faced a more united front than they expected. You can read more about this on your own. But what Lewis would have been exposed to is a toxic environment of anti-African racism. And uh, here's the um, Esposizione Italiana del uh, 1884 yeah, in Turin. So Turin holds its first human zoo. And I put up a slide of what's called Italy's Mezzo Giorno. And it's widely seen. It's, it's the southern part of Italy where the sun shines brightest in the middle of the day. But it was also seen as barbaric, violent, and irrational. It was talked about as an Africa on the European continent. And if you'd like to read more about this area, this region of Italy, in the wake of um, unification, see John Dickey's book, Darkest Italy, The Nation and Stereotypes of the Mezzo Giorno, 1860 to 1900. It's published in 1999. And so she's hearing uh, and seeing human zoos, human zoos, uh, this kind of overwhelming um, uh, kind of discussion about African inferiority. And I think this is what causes her to leave Italy. But uh, a human zoo comes to Italy in 1884. The Italian general exhibition held in Turin was the new nation state's first great national exhibition and represented an opportunity to illustrate not only the new nation's economic, social, and artistic achievements, but also Italy's first colonial enterprise in Eastern Africa, in the area of the Bay of Assa. For the first time, in addition to a rather poor exhibition of products from the Abyssinian region, living native Danakil or Asabeses were brought to Italy. The first living ethnographical exhibition enclosed in its pretend African village and enlivened by solemn receptions, public promenades and displays and theatrical appearances was merely the first that ushered in between 1890 and 1914, a string of living ethnographical exhibitions. It was also how Italy, despite the uncertainty surrounding the Mezzogiorno, proclaimed itself white, European and civilized. And then she moves in 1901 to London. And um, that's where she dies. She's listed as Mary Lewis. Uh, she died in the Hammersmith um, uh, Infirmary. Uh, she is, her occupation is spinster and sculptural artist. Uh, and she died of Bright's disease, a kidney ailment in 1907. And her death notice was found by inveterate investigators into her biography. And finally, a few years ago, a, a tombstone was placed on her grave. But she listed her um, priest as her executor and her beneficiary. And I just want to read the closing lines of a piece I wrote on um, Edmonia Lewis and Catholicism. Despite spending the majority of her creative life in what was also the cradle of her faith, Lewis left Italy permanently in 1893. What prompted her departure? Post-unification Rome would seem to have been ideal for Lewis, both spiritually and politically. The Pope was granted an independent country within the heart of Rome, the nation state known as Vatican City, while Italy was unified under a central government. However, one possible motivation for her moving from Rome to Paris in 1893 was the post-unification atmosphere of Italy. Like those European countries that conceptualized themselves as empires, part of the expected process of imperialism was the colonization of Africa. And while both France and Great Britain had colonized parts of Africa, 
the newness of Italian imperial designs made the topic ripe for widespread cultural discussion. Lewis likely would have found Italy's post-unification discourse on the inferiority of Africans and the benefits of appropriating North African resources to be hauntingly similar to US thinking. Just as in the United States, the Catholic Church in Italy once again was a major voice in support of exploitation and racism. Italy with the full backing of the papacy began to colonize North Africa in 1880. And while Ethiopia defeated Italy in 1895, 96, by World War I, Italy had annexed Libya, Somalia, Eritrea, and the Dodecanese Islands. By 1901, Lewis was living in the Hammersmith District in West London. She remained a devout Catholic and was able to continue her religious practice because of the power of Pope Pius IX, who had once again seated England with Catholic dioceses. Lewis died in London on, in 1907, naming herself spinster and sculptor and her parish priest as executor, of her estate and beneficiary in her will. She chose to settle in London because she had established a network of support there, but she nevertheless became, in women's studies scholar Robin Wigman's wording, doubly minoritized, both racially and in terms of religious affiliation. Wigman writes, in using the word minoritized instead of minority, I want to indicate social processes, not statistical populations. Both women and people of color as groups, each to, 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 excuse me, statistically a global majority are minoritized within patriarchal, colonial and capitalist formations. And only in some contexts do either of these categories indicate a numerical minority, end of quote. And now I continue. Indeed, no matter her relocation, Lewis had to negotiate this marginalized status of being. Tracing the social processes of Lewis's various contexts shed some light on her choices, her faith, her art, and why geographical context came to sig signify so mightily in her deliberate and careful expatriations. Ultimately, despite hostility and assumptions about her identity as a native and African-American Catholic woman, Lewis found ways to propagate her faith and her art as spiritual and aesthetic practices. And this is the cover of my book. It's now 11 years old and thank you. Thank you so much. So I know that we um, were a little bit over time so I wanna be mindful of everyone's evening. So please, those of you who don't have remaining questions, thank you so much for coming. You can thank feel you. free to hop off. But we have some wonderful questions who have come in. I know I have some questions, so let's just get straight to it. So Christine Oaklander, one of our former um, virtual speakers uh, says, fascinating lecture. You've given us prior artworks that influenced Lewis's choices, coins, such as prior, such as coins, prior sculptures, etc. So she's wondering, how do you know she was looking at penitent Magdalene or the coins? Um, because those things, she she did uh, spend time in Florence. Uh, I think the the prominence of of Donatello, uh, it, it was unavoidable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as a Catholic and as an American, she would have had access to the Vatican collections had she asked. And it just seems to me that sculptors were looking um, mm -hmm. in the same way that Crawford was looking, maybe not necessarily at Michelangelo's last judgment, but at a last judgment. They were surrounded by Catholic iconography and they took full advantage. That's great. Yeah, I was, I was can't help but think of the prominence of that Magdalene figure when you're in you know, various towns in Italy. We have a great question from our wonderful curatorial assistant, Allegra Davis. How did public reaction to Lewis's sculptures of black and indigenous subjects differ from reaction to those by white artists? Um, they were read as more authentic. Mm. And you know, that's, that's the issue with, again, artists who have ovaries and artists who have race. Um, They are in, in the kind of old ways of thinking about creativity. Um, 
they weren't allowed the, the measure of objectivity mm -hmm. that white male artists were allowed. Uh, and so whereas white male artists had a range of uh, techniques and subjects open to them, not so with women, you know, who weren't allowed to take life drawing classes and were not allowed to display the, the nude even though you know you could go home and undress and sketch yourself all day, you weren't allowed to show it. And so the precarity of their status as ladies or as uh, as raced um, were always present. And so Lewis was read as a more authentic interpreter, even though Longfellow is as far away as you can get from authentic. Mm -hmm. It's kind of once, you know, drawing upon Longfellow as this point of reference, it's once removed so that the irony of that is so fascinating. Um, I have two questions that have come through about her grave. So one was, is the grave located in London? And yes. which cemetery is she buried in? And presumably is she buried in the Catholic section since she was such a devout mm -hmm. Catholic? Uh -huh. uh, she's buried in Hammersmith. And if you go to Albert Henderson's website, edmoniolewis.com, all the information you'd ever need about when the grave was found, where exactly it's located, all of that is on his website. Okay. And his father is Harry Henderson, and it's Harry Henderson and uh, Romare Bearden who wrote the huge survey of African American art. And his son, Albert, um, can keeps Harry alive through Edmonia Lewis. And so links to all, and uh, a, an active list of Articles and books recently published on Lewis are all there on the website, edmonialewis.com. Oh, great. Albert. Well, I will definitely be taking a look at that website to learn a little bit more. I mean, something that I'm, I've am i been so struck with when we've kind of invited you to come do this, this talk and, and teach us a little bit more about Lewis is some of the threads between church and Lewis. You know, I think um, both were very religious, devout creators. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we think that church may have been in Rome around the same time that Lewis was there. They had similar social circles. Mm -hmm. So something I'm wondering is if you can see any threads or connections. I know that you have a family history and, and interest in Olana. So just kind of as a last question, where, where might you see some of those intersections, if mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, church does visit the Holy Land and uh, paints there. And John Davis wrote a wonderful book on American artists in the Holy Land. And Sally Promi's work on the thread of spirituality that runs through U.S. artists' work is also important. And um, yeah, that it it does it does make church and Lewis unique in that the kind of Protestants who settled in Italy, um, someone like Hiram Powers, right? He's remembered actually for his help with unification as is William Wetmore Story. But um, in William Vance's two volume work on American America's Rome, um, Americans tend to be very casual and suspicious of the Catholic iconography, whereas Lewis and Church embrace um, the, the spirituality and the, the religions of those places uh, where they find it and they seek, the, they seek it out. They aren't threatened by it or mm. dismissive of it. And so that's what I, I learned to appreciate about both Church and Lewis. Mm. Wonderful. Well, great. Well, thank you again. This was such a wonderful illumination of a, of a fabulous 19th century figure that I'm excited to learn even more about. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to kind of um, share one line from your the beginning of your book, which is you quote the Godfather and say that you believe in art history. And I definitely think that when we can shed a light on some of these figures, it makes me believe in art history, you know, all the more. So thank you for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.